Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books Radio, sponsored by the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Joshua Green. And we're going to be talking about a magnificent work of art that's in print now called The Essential Marilyn Monroe, Milton H. Green, 50 Sessions. Joshua, welcome to the program. Thanks, John. Great to be here. You know, one of the things you said in the acknowledgement struck me, and that was that you wanted to thank Douglas and Francoise Kirkland, who were instrumental in your transition from darkroom to digital. Now, I would assume that everything that Milton did went through the old system of being in the darkroom with developer and fixer bath and finding just the right amount of development to, to make for the best picture. Is that right? Yeah, he had me in the dark room at 11 years old. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, friend, uh, Douglas Kirkland uh, does a tribute to, to your father, Milton Green. Uh, he ta- calls him Color Photography's Wonder Boy. Uh, is that an apt description, you think? Yeah, that was based on an article that came out in a, in a it wasn't Aperture, I'm trying to remember. It was, it was a photography magazine in the early, in the 40s mm-hmm. where he was featured, and they call him Color Photographer Wonder Boy. That's where he got it from. Mm-hmm. Now, this, this actually is a, a photographic historical journal of, of the, the relationship between Color Photography's Wonder Boy, your dad, and, and Marilyn Monroe. Uh, they met in 53, I think, and from 53 to 57... They had a significant business partnership. She was like a part of the Green family. Um, they formed Marilyn Monroe Productions. All of that was going on during this time when she was, I, I would say, his muse. Uh, and they produced uh, and they produced the bus stop and Prince of the Showgirl together. Mm-hmm. So, so there were movies they did together as well as all of this fabulous photography work. Now, right, yeah. she had gotten. She had begun to get fame before 53, right? I mean, she had other photographers and uh, movies and stuff. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She, she, she was, her, her career was beginning to skyrocket. And then the, the true impetus for my father to get involved was uh, when they first met and started to get to know each other, she confided in him and told her, she told him that uh, she was frustrated with her contract with 20th which was basically what used to be called a slave contract, where the studio controls your, your, what movies you can do, what roles you can play. And um, she was basically being treated by 20th as, you know, a pretty blonde girl, just go ahead and do your tits and ass kind of thing, if, if you want to say it right. Mm-hmm. But she wasn't being given the respect. She wanted to become a more serious character actress, and... And uh, Zanuck, at 20th, wouldn't allow it. He just didn't respect her enough to give her that lead. Mm -hmm. And and she felt frustrated by that. And technically, my father looked at the contract, and uh, they found a loophole in it. They felt they could leverage a breach. And he reached out to her and said, I see a path through here. Come to New York. Uh, live, live, come live in New York. I'll cover all your expenses, and let's file a lawsuit against these guys. And through 54 to 55, that's what exactly happened. And she went to, she lived a different life in New York, and uh, lived, in, <coughs> excuse me, lived in my family's house, and my, in our apartment in New York, and in Connecticut, and had a... Uh, a different aspect of life. Uh, my father introduced her to friends in New York, Marlon Brando, Sinatra, Sally Davis, and um, Dizzy Gillespie, Ella Fitzgerald. And she basically saw a whole other life of music and art and dance and started taking dancing lessons. <laughs> and um, a little early in the morning, I'm sorry, I'm sounding rough. It's okay. But um, she basically had a, a wonderful time. She was well taken care of. She was very happy. And um, while they were fighting the lawsuit, she focused on her career and her skills. 
acting, music, dance, singing. And um, it took it took a year and a half, you know. I mid fifty five. They had won the lawsuit, and they started Mount Monroe Productions. Mm-hmm. My father, like many photographers, wanted to get into film as a producer director, and um, she wanted to have her own production company and basically control her her scripts, her director's approval, and the parts that she wanted to play. And that's exactly what they did. And the the, the image of her as just a, a, a pretty blonde with a great body is, is unfair. You talked about her, her dancing lessons. Uh, she also took acting lessons with Lee Strasberg, who's like the best at coaching acting, right? Yeah, and the Strasberg story is, is, is quite unique in that you know, in the Strasbourg, the actor studio style is a actor goes there and has to be selected by the other actors. Mm-hmm. And she went to the actor studio, and it she did not perform in front of them for their approval until after twelve months. Mm-hmm. She was so intimidated yet respectful that she truly studied the craft, watched everybody, and, and did her homework and practiced. And after 12 months, she did her first piece in front of them, and everybody was surprised, because they basically poo-pooed her as a blonde bombshell from Hollywood, and the only reason why she's here is um, is to... Is to to bring money to the Strasburgs, but the truth was, she was very serious, and she really did very well in in that piece that she did after 12 months, and then she gained everyone's respect. Mm Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. So, um, there's there's an awful lot of art here, and it speaks to the special relationship of trust that that Milton and Marilyn seem to have. Um, some, Some very unique things that we see. Uh, I remember that one of them was in a in a mansion of a friend of Milton's, and she was actually posing with a statue. And one of the things noted is that um, she, even with an inanimate object, you know, her personality comes through, her charm comes through. Yeah, that was uh, Sidney Gilleroff, who was one of the great hairdressers of the day that uh, Milton, that Marilyn worked with. And that was, they were doing lighting and hair tests for Prince and the Showgirl. If you look at the the clothing she's wearing, it's actually just a piece of fabric that's been pinned. Mm-hmm. And it became the neckline for the dress that she wore in Prince and the Showgirl. Mm-hmm. Milton was always looking at the aesthetics. His, he saw his role as to be conscientious of how light, camera, and clothing worked best for her and so he would work with the directors and the cameramen and the lighting guys and recommend what would be best for her he was basically a aesthetic protector Mm -hmm. of how she looks on film yeah i remember growing up as a kid that look and life magazines in particular were filled with beautiful photos their first shoot was for look magazine with the mandolin wasn't it Yes, and uh, Milton worked for Look and for Life. He was one of the few photographers that wasn't exclusive to one to the other. And, um, yeah, both magazines were very good for him. I mean, Milton did thousands of pictures in both publications for not just personalities, but also fashion. Mm -hmm. Milton basically was a fashion photographer, you know. I see. And and he wasn't... uh... The only one helping making Marilyn famous, I saw uh, as I was looking through the internet that um, just in 2015 they recovered uh, her nude calendar from 53, and of course in 53 she posed for Playboy. Uh, but somehow the sensuousness that, that comes through in the mandolin and subsequently in, in another one in 53 in the negligee uh, show, right. show a beautiful side of her that uh, doesn't require nudity. Yes, well, keep in mind, the, the famous Playboy Red Velvet series by Tom Kelly 
was actually done in 49. Okay. And it was released in those days as a calendar for like, a, I don't want to say, it was, it was a calendar that was very popular in in the world of mechanics and garages and, you know, that, they used to farm out pictures like that to those kinds of places that would have like one picture and then the 12 rip away months on a little pad underneath it. That was mm-hmm. sort of the, the method of the day. Um, Milton's, obviously, Milton wasn't that kind of photographer and didn't want to do that kind of thing. He also, because he had he had learned of her interest in becoming a serious character actress, his focus was, I don't want to do the TNA stuff, I don't want to do the Hollywood blonde bombshell stuff. Mm-hmm. And most of the pictures in the book and most of the sittings they did together were really stimulated by him. They weren't all on assignment. Few of them were. He was trying to build up a portfolio of imagery showing her that she could be a character and that in, and, and that she would build and he would build her confidence so that she would believe in herself and realize that everything she really felt could be achieved as a character actress. Mm-hmm. And so that was his, his, his primary focus. So a lot of it were fantasy characters that they created together as a collaboration. Uh-huh. And they were beneficiaries of all the, the wardrobe in the back of 20th Century Fox Studios, where she would uh, adorn herself with various kinds of costumes and do a whole series like she did on The Peasant Woman. Yes, yes, exactly. And The Peasant is a great is a great example of that um, because she they went in there and they put on the outfit uh, that was oh my mind just went blank and I forgot the name of the movie my goodness Jesus uh-huh. um, <laughs> oh Yes, I should have the book in front of me. Well, okay. So anyway, she did this. She did that shoot with an outfit that was worn by Jennifer Jones. Ah, okay. In an Academy Award-winning role, mm-hmm. and I just forgot the name of the movie. I'm so sorry. That's okay. It'll probably it's come back to us in a bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving look, through the book to try and find that right now. Yeah, look at the look at the chapter heading of the peasant. It'll tell you. My goodness, I feel embarrassed for all your your listeners. I'm sorry, but you know things happen. It's quite all right. Uh, anyway, that 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 whole sitting was done on the back lots of 20th, mm-hmm. and um, it's one of the most charming sittings, in my opinion, and. Of course, in the book, what we added are some pictures that have never been seen before um, that I love. The black and whites of her drinking a bottle of wine and, and posing by the camera. And uh, the picture in the doorway, which is a favorite, which we restored from scratch all over again. you got to realize that most of the pictures that Milton shot of Marilyn, particularly the color ones, had never been seen by the public because as early as the 70s they had lost their color they had faded they had really become unprintable Mm -hmm. in the old style of printing so it wasn't until the capability of computers came along in the 90s where we were able to actually scan these scan this faded film and then digitally bring it back to life and mm-hmm. That's why this book took five years, and some of these images, most of these images, have forty, fifty, and sixty hours of work into them. Well, that's intense. They're very intense. And a lot very of a, a lot of the photos have never been seen before. But interestingly, some of them didn't turn out as well as others because uh, Milton had a tendency from time to time to develop his thirty-five millimeter in the bathroom <laughs> by himself, and uh, so there's a couple of grainy photos as a result because they just couldn't be fully restored, I guess. You've done your homework. Good man, John. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. He would get anxious to see black and white. He would process it in the bath in the bathroom of the hotel room, and he there's some pictures there that look very very grainy, 
and basically what we call underexposed. And what happened was he didn't process it long enough. He miscalculated the temperature and the time. Mm -hmm. And so they looked that way. But they're wonderful pictures, and I felt it was the right thing to do is to include them in the book and tell that story, uh, to share in that sort of... Because those are like candidates mm -hmm. with a 35 millimeter camera, you know. What... Uh how would you characterize Marilyn as a model compared to others? What was what was unique about her in that regard? It's come back to me. The movie of the peasants with Jennifer Jones was Songs of Bernadette. Ah, great. <laughs> I knew it would there come you back. Go. <laughs> and I just got to the page of the peasant. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so there's uh, 280 images here, and I'm just in awe of how alluring and come hither she is and it just uh, it just blows me away because I don't think every model had the same personality portrayed in film and I know that Milton may have had a lot to do with that he did and and to give, but also to give Marilyn credit she she truly was a wonderful model and as you can see by many photographers who photographed her um, but the relationship with Milton that shows up in their collaboration is this sense of trust. And you're talking about 4,000 images over a period of four years. So there's there's no one that photographed her more over a lengthy period of time. Most photographers, if they photographed her two, three, four, five times was a lot. Uh, most of them photographed her once. But, um, so there's this historical type of reference and a relationship that is obviously at the base of their a friendship and relationship that's at the base of their trust and excitement to work together mm -hmm. and hence you get these everything from the come hither to the just the candid where she looks up at you right into the camera where it's not about pomps and circumstance it's just about hey it's me right and and I think those pictures are very personal and charming. That's why I love them as candidates in the book. And then there's, you know, let's let's make it happen. Let's get on set. Let's go to location. Let's be this character that we're going to be, whether it's a peasant or a ballerina under the trees. The Black Sitting, of course, is one of their most famous series that really, because of the risque, semi-nude attitude that was shown and captured there, was never even printed until 72 the wow. first time. Wow, how about that? You know, and I printed them in the book with a warm tone, almost sepia style, because the last time Milton and I printed those pictures in a dark room, we used a Portriga paper, which is a, a, a warm tone sepia style paper, and with a selenium de developer, which adds the sepia warm tone to it. And we printed his last portfolio uh, mm -hmm. that was sold in galleries at the time. But I wanted to take him to the extra step. I mean, I really printed this book and manipulated the pictures as if he was alive with me, working with today's technology. And I wanted to honor him in, all the way through by bringing his his directives that he taught me in the dark room all the way through to how we treated the pictures for the book mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have one photo from the seven-year itch set, but uh, I, I suspect that Milton had a little photo envy of Sam Shaw, who captured that moment when the dress blows up over the subway grate. Actually, Sam and Milton were good friends okay. in New York. <laughs> yeah. No, they hung out together. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it was actually Sam that invited Milton to the set. Wow. Uh, and that's why he was he was in the back behind the scenes sort of looking on. That's why he got that picture from the back. Mm -hmm. well, another one that, that uh, another collection that caught my eye was the ballerina. And I, I think it was beautiful, but primarily I was interested in the fact that the dress was two sizes too small and she had to hold up the front bodice the whole time they were doing this photography shoot. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and uh, that, that, again, their sense of humor and 
capability to sort of like, hey, let's just make it work. Let's have a good time. Uh, came through, and they did a whole series like that. Mm -hmm. And you can see uh, some of the black and whites where she's standing up in the book. You can see that the back of the dress is wide open. I mean, that dress was definitely too too small. <laughs> so um, the the studio that Milton worked from. Uh, not always, but very often. The Milton Studio, 480 Lexington, was a famous location. Why? What was special about that studio? Well, it's, it was an old-style building in New York that had a... Um, on his floor, the 14th floor, it had a balcony, like a veranda, that was all the way around the whole outside of the building, mm -hmm. which, of course, would never happen today because it's a cat burglar's dream. Right. You could just, you know, rob one place after another by walking around the veranda. And had these big glass doors that were elegant, very European, and you walk out onto the veranda. And, um, Milton photographed many people out there uh, uh, over time. Uh, Gloria Vanderbilt, uh, Cary Grant, uh, Sammy Davis, uh uh, just the name of Judy Garland. I mean, he used the veranda a lot mm -hmm. as an alternative space to photograph people. But the studio was a great studio. The building was a great building also because most of the building had nothing but photographers and architects and graphic designers and, uh, and two different companies, one of them that made Saltzman, which made some of the biggest stands that photographers would use, and uh, and uh, a gentleman named Marty Forster, who was an institution back in the day, who repaired cameras for all the photographers. Mm -hmm. You know, but it was it was essentially a place where it was a business building that was, this building was torn down when they built the Pan Am building on uh, around forty. 43rd Street and Park Avenue. Uh -huh. This was on Lexington, 480 Lex. It was right there. Um, but, you know, what What was cool about it is my father loved jazz, and he would make the studio available for his friends to come and jam at night. Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie, Gene Krupa, these guys would come and just get on it and have a great time. And uh, as a matter of fact, I have some early recordings. My father, being the geek in his own way, he used to have a recorder that in those days it would record on vinyl. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's sort of trippy. Uh -huh. But, you know, this was, a, this was a different time than we live in today. It was a gentle time, and it was a time that celebrated art. We didn't have the entourages and the madness. I mean, you know. Yeah. Famous people would walk the streets of New York with a buddy or a girlfriend and they just show up. <laughs> there wasn't four limousines and a press agent managing everything and making sure everything's in place before the celebrity shows up at a studio with, you know, 30 people around them. It's just not the way it was. It was so much simpler. Uh, I wish I could have been in those times. I, um, the the 480 Lexington just reminds me of a temple of art because of all the uh, influential folks that were there and their particular chosen professions. I, I think the jazz music makes it extra special. Uh, Marilyn was so good at posing with various objects, and, but it, it struck me when I looked at the Oriental how well she worked with Pekingese. <laughs> <laughs> a great story because what really happened was that was for a fashion shoot for look and Milton photographed Marilyn as the model and Joe Euler a very close friend of my father's and a wonderful painter uh, who has his own celebrity career um, as a sense of humor that they both shared is they decided, well, it's an Oriental story about Oriental, so let's throw in some Oriental dogs mm -hmm. as a prop, you know, which was their set, their way of going, let's have some fun. Yeah. And, and, that, and that, of course, there's dog lovers 
There always will be dog lovers. That's a very popular series that dog lovers love to have. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't leave without mentioning another uh, relationship she had. Sammy Davis Jr., who had, was just recuperating for the accident where he lost his eye, um, met uh, them at that time. And uh, uh, apparently uh, Marilyn took a shine to, to Sammy, and they had a, a great friendship. Yes, and uh, and my father and Sammy became friends until the day both of them died. Sammy was my godfather, and I've seen him. I saw him all my life, fantastic, a thousand times, anywhere. Mm-hmm. But uh, the story is really cool. Is that uh, Sammy was doing his first album cover, and he was photographed by a musician. I mean, he was photographed by a photographer in New York, and the pictures came back, and they were shall we say, uh, inappropriate, unaccept- unacceptable, <laughs> unacceptable. Okay. But what really, what it really was about, and, and please understand, I don't say this in any negative way, but when you're photographing a person of color, you have to light them differently than a person who's white. Okay. And that's because the skin has to reflect the highlights in order to be lit properly where with white people you don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. And that that was basically the mistake. The photographer had not did not understand how to photograph a, a person of color. And so when they rejected the pictures, his agent, uh, Jesse Rand, asked around, well, who should I get to photograph Sammy for my album covers? Oh, well, this hot new photographer in town, his name is Milton Green. Sammy took the address and just went to the studio by himself, walked in. And this was while he was filming Marilyn, right, that he walked into the studio, right? Yeah, he walked in while Milton was actually photographing Marilyn. Mm -hmm. And to everybody's surprise, of course, you know, my God, that's Sammy Davis. Oh, you're Marilyn Monroe. Oh, Milton Green. Oh, oh, okay, we're we're good. Let's hang out. Sammy, Sammy hung out and uh, relaxed while Milton finished photographing Marilyn, and then Marilyn hung out while Milton photographed Sammy. Mm-hmm. And that's why I included it in the book, because I think it's a great story of, again, capturing the simplicity and the elegance of the day, of how people reacted and related to each other and charmed each other and were respectful in that way. And... And it did. It started a relationship that lasted everybody's lifetime. Mm-hmm. And, and Sammy and... took Marilyn to town in New York and introduced him to, introduced her to all his friends as well. And that was really what made Marilyn enjoy this period of her life in New York, where she felt taken care of and protected and was happy. It was a very happy time for her. You know, I, I don't like my mother and I always remind people that we don't like it when people look at her as a victim. Right. Oh, what a terrible life. Oh, how sad I am that we have it. Listen, she was a very smart woman. She knew what she was dealing with, and she was very aware of the reality of the time that she lived in. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we can talk about her terrible childhood and all those things, but at the end of the day, she owned it, and she was an adult about her life, enjoyed the company of men, as we know, but it, but there was no victimization here. And she'd be leading the Me Too movement in a heartbeat if she was alive. Super. Trust me. Yeah, that's great. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We, we need to talk about some of the people that, that paraded through my childhood uh, the, at the Friars Club. She was seated with Eddie Fisher, Sammy Davis Jr., and Phil Silvers. Uncle Milty was the, the host. I mean, there's so many walks down memory lane that you can take with this beautiful collection of art that Milton and, and Marilyn put together in those classic years in the 50s. We've been talking with Joshua Green, who painstakingly restored some beautiful works of art. The book is... 
50, the Essential Marilyn Monroe, Milton H. Green, 50 Sessions. It's well worth a look. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. I appreciate your listening. Remember that if you don't catch us during our regularly scheduled broadcasts, you can also find us on YouTube at Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. Thanks for listening.